So today I'm talking to Noel Pearson here and for those who don't know, everybody who will know who I am the, in the MMT community, but Noel is a, a lawyer by training. That's right. And uh, first came to prominence in my mind when uh, with the land rights movement. Correct. And the Marbo and the Wick stuff mm -hmm. in, in Queensland yep. as a lawyer. And then uh, more recently... Um, Cape York Development, what's it exactly called? Cape York Institute. Right, Cape York Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Cape York, for those who are unaware, for international people, is in the north of Queensland. Right. An incredibly disadvantaged area. Mm -hmm. uh, strong, what's the sort of proportion of Indigenous Australians? About there? half of the population of Cape people. York is Indigenous, yeah. And what's the sort of uh, income divide in that area? Oh. Huge. Huge. Yeah. Very low life expectancy. Yeah. Probably around 50. 50. Is that falling? I mean... It's falling. It has been falling nationwide, isn't it? Yeah. And remote communities in particular. The deaths are getting younger and younger. And so you've been trying for years to work out solutions to that? Yes. Now, Noel came into this story, what we've been doing is uh, trying to work out this uh, coalition to a big picture sort of mission for Australia. Is that the way you think about it? Absolutely. Well, I'd had some discussions with, uh, Sa uh, with the father of a young guy who'd been uh, researching MMT, and uh, we'd had a few conversations that kind of piqued my interest in this modern monetary theory. And so I then started reading stuff on the web, came across your blog site, and started watching the YouTube videos. Yeah. And then I realised that uh, you had this new textbook out. And um, so I got my secretary to track you down. Oh gosh. <laughs> so Sam must have rung you out of the blue at some point or emailed you. I think you. she sent me an email. She sent you an email. And, and yeah, it wasn't, you didn't ring me out of the blue, but yeah. she, she emailed me out of the okay. blue. Okay. Yeah. And said, would it be, uh, I was actually out about when I got the email and I looked at it on my phone and I wrote, replied and said, yeah, sure. She said, can, can Noel ring me? And I wrote back and said, yeah, sure. I didn't have a clue what it was about. Yeah. And then you just sort of ring back. So by then I'd connected your name because I'd, I'd, I'd heard of Bill Mitchell at the University of Newcastle and I'd heard of Coffee. Yeah, the, the Centre for Employment and Equity. Full Employment and Equity, yeah. And um, so that's a... 20-year-old memory, that, the coffee memory. Well, coffee began in 1998. Right. And right. coffee, at the time, the, um, the, the coffee's a university research fund, uh, research centre. And why we, why we um, formed coffee was as a response to the way the Australian government was starting to fund university research. Mm -hmm. And they moved from what they they were attempting to move from what they called an individual research funding model through the Australian Research Council to a centre type funding model. They had some weird idea. I mean, the ASC always has weird ideas like this. Mm. And so 
to, to maximise our chances of getting research funding, we've st everyone started to form centres, and that's how coffee came about. We, right. And In the economics department? Uh, at the time, I was actually he still head of the economics department there, and uh, was formed within the department, but um, it had an uneasy existence in, in that particular faculty because mm -hmm. at the time the faculty was embracing a much more entrepreneurial sort of that, what I call the neoliberal sort of bean counter approach to mm -hmm. education. And uh, the, a dean not long after that said to me, well, they didn't even call them deans after that, they called them pro-vice-chancellors, you know, as a sort of wave of corporatism took over. But uh, uh, the dean once, that dean said to me, we don't want any social science influences in this faculty anymore. Mm. Which, of course, coffee was core social science research. And so eventually I did a deal with the university and uh, took the centre out of the faculty and just did our own thing. It was fine. Right. Yeah. I was going to ask you that... Uh, I remember, I've got a quote. <laughs> when I, 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 I thought about you a lot in, in the early 2000s when you mm. did that uh, Chifley Memorial Lecture, mm. Ben Chifley. That was Bathurst. Yeah, Bathurst. Uh, mm. When was that, April 2000? Correct. Yeah. And, that's, and that, 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 that address has really really resonated. I think that gave you more prominence in my view than, mm. than the Marbo stuff. Mm. Mm. And um, because that, that appealed to a lot of the, what I call the neoliberal whites, mm. whether mm. you meant to or not, mm. who, because you, meant, you started talking about passive welfare and yep. stuff like that. Yep. And uh, that appealed to all of the prejudice on the, who, who had the view that Indigenous Australians were just lazy and were just being subsidised by government largesse, mm. you know, all the language, mm. remember mm. all the language. Mm. And I thought at the time, when I read that, I didn't hear the, the talk, but I thought at the time when I, after I'd read the transcript, mm that what this guy, literally, what this guy needs is a dose of MMT now. We hadn't even started calling it MMT at that mm. stage. That was 2000, 2000. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, the, the, the core MMT group had formed. We'd been working together for about five years already. And so the body of work was already there, but we hadn't yet called it anything. And what I thought, well, you know, that's what I thought about your, your that that shift in your thinking, the mm. way you projected it, and uh, that. And and I checked recently. There, there's no mention of full employment in that talk. Mm. So, if if you had have read what and understood what I think you do now, mm. and which is forced us to, uh, uh, led to us to come together. Mm. Would have you made that speech in 2000 in the same way? i tell you the origins of my Interesting. Um, thinking. And in my mind, hysteresis, as you economists calls it, and passive welfare are the same thing. The, okay, the, in my so hysteresis means is path dependence. Correct. You, you, you are your history. Yep. And the long-term unemployment um, and the social problems that result from that is what I call the problem of passive welfare. That um, uh, these social problems start to manifest and become start to snowball um, as the generations move on and and people are caught in a cycle of unemployment mm. that their grandparents were in, their parents were in, and they themselves and their children have the yeah. same prospects, right? I, I 
launched the passive welfare critique in 1999 because the prevailing debate at the end of the 20th century in Indigenous affairs was we've had 30 years of land rights, um, we've had all of these human rights and the Aboriginal situation is worse. Mm. They, they've got all their land back or you know they're very much on their way of getting their land back but the situation in the communities has got all these problems of violence and child neglect and all these social problems, yeah. substance abuse and so on, right? And, and I thought the, the mainstream interpretation of what was going on in Indigenous policy was wrong because it was blaming land rights as if all of these good things that had been achieved um, since the 70s, since the 60s, all of these good things were to blame for the problems that have emerged and I felt that there was an alternative interpretation that needed to go out there. And that alternative interpretation, in my view, still is my view, is that when our people became largely dependent on welfare, as opposed to my father's generation who were out working, yeah. working, in, working for discriminatory wages, sure. but nevertheless working, and through the 50s and 60s, in the post-war period, um, lots of Aboriginal people from Cape York were on the road, working on the railways, arrowroot, sugarcane, any kind of rural work and so on. Um, and and it'd be, a lot of it would be seasonal, um, going out when the work was available, coming back to the settlements um, in the Cape and so on. Um, because there was really no other option and, and, uh, and, and hitting the road for work was the kind of norm. But of course, and, and the big, big source of work for people in regions like Cape York was the cattle industry. But when the, when the equal wage decision came down in 1965, yeah. um, well, all of a sudden we're the stock workers, indigenous stock workers, are entitled to equal wages. Um, in, the, in the case before the commission, um, the pastoralists argued that we, we're going to have to toss people off the station. We're not going to be able to pay them equal wages. And the Commonwealth government's response at the time was, well, we'll put them on unemployment benefits. That was the fatal decision mm. because it led to tens of thousands of people across northern Australia leaving the cattle stations because the pastoralists refused to pay um, everyone. That, and, you know, it was difficult because it wasn't as if you had a two dozen stock workers. No, you had 68 people living on the station, including the children and the families mm. and the grandparents and so on. There were little small communities who lived on these stations, many of whom did a lot of work for the station. The women and the older men and so on, they all contributed to the work on the station. Not all of them were full-time cattle workers, but they all contributed to the running of the property. And the partial said, well, if We'll only pay for the, you know, half a dozen people we need to muster cattle and so on. The rest of them go into the country town or go into the mission. So, so you're saying that the pastoralists, the the owners, were sort of providing a welfare system themselves. Yeah, and they were on their country. They were living on their land, right? Um, uh, and, the, and the children had the connection to the land and they knew the country, they rode over the country, kept their connection with it. When they were shipped off into the missions and the fringes of country towns on the reserves, at the end of every, you know, edge of every country town, the reserves existed. So the Aboriginal people got shipped off the cattle stations into these places. And of course, the pubs opened up for the first time to Aboriginal people. 
we had unemployment benefit, we had idle young people. And alcohol. And that started alcohol amongst men at first. Mm -hmm. And of course, as the, as the thing moves on, the young women join the drinking, binging and so on, and the women, the older women and older men are looking after the kids. And this, this snowballing problem I read, a, read a, an article once that said that um, when alcohol was, for, when, when, say, white populations first hit, confronted alcohol, mm. they went crazy. Yeah. And it took centuries to sort of... To get it on. To work out it's some sort of stability, yeah. Yeah. And the, the kind of practices that you need to control this consumption, you know, the social practices yeah. that that enable you to control something that very easily can get out of control, yeah. weren't there. So that's sort of like a human problem. That's a human, you human-wide problem. Yeah. Um, the, the white fellas were as problematic with the grog when the colony out here started yeah. as anybody, you know. Yeah. But the dense kinship also is an issue for us. When you have a very close-knit kinship, it makes the control of alcohol even harder. Mm. But, but my main problem is this, Bill, that I, I, my conviction was that the appalling snowballing of the social problems. I came from a community where there had been no suicides, no homicides, nobody in prison. In the 1960s, there was nobody in prison. Mm. What about child abuse? Could... And no child abuse. Mm. My parents would have been happy for me to stay in anyone's house in the village. You know, every family looked after everybody else's children. And all of that had crumbled. We were poor, but we had very strong social and cultural strength. Uh, poverty was our problem. Everybody worked hard, everybody took responsibility for their children and uh, so I, I developed this critique, there's this poverty and then there's this passivity, you know, and um, where even if you do have a work opportunity, um, it's not necessarily going to be taken. I went to Vietnam in the early 90s, probably 1990 I went, uh, just on a tour. Walked around the northern part of Vietnam and saw villages and, and the constant thought I had walking around Vietnam is that these people are in poverty, similar to us, in fact worse, um, but they're vital. They, they are not passive, and if you put a school up 10 kilometres away, they're going to send their kids, okay, they, they, they'll get the kids walking there. And I began to think about what is the difference between what I'm seeing here in Vietnam and what I'm seeing in Cape York? What is the difference here? And this is where my passive welfare critique came in. It, was, it wasn't the fault of the people, it was, and this wasn't a racial thing. You know, I've been reading about similar circumstances in England and so on, where in um, where people who'd been um, shifted out of the workforce generationally, um, these these social problems start to accumulate. So the, I I don't know that I'd change my argument in relation to this concept of passive welfare. And I've always tried to distinguish between classical welfare, the good welfare state that distributes opportunity and support mm. for people who need it, versus this passive welfare thing, which is a permanent exclusion from the economy. Mm. And, mean, and the problems that arise from that. You no, know, I, I, the way I saw the welfare state was that and we've written about this and developed the idea into the, a three-pillar approach mm -hmm. that the post-war consensus yep. that applied to 
predominantly the white population in Australia, was that you had a pillar of an economic pillar which was based upon full employment yeah. and, uh, and wage equity and uh, government's responsibility to maintain full employment through using their policies. You had a, um, a, a, what I called the collective pillar, which was our rights as citizens to equal access to services and uh, things like that and uh, that those services would be delivered through the public sector uh, as a responsibility of governments to that rights of citizenship. And then there was a redistributive pillar which picked up the sort of those who missed out on the full employment if you were sick or old uh, or disabled. Uh, or temporarily unemployed. Remember, unemployment benefits in Australia was, we used to call long-term unemployment uh, 12 weeks. You know, now it's two years, or you know, people average is going up and up, and unemployment benefits were always intended to just be a short-term. Yes. It was never intended to be an income support type thing for, and so, yeah, you know, that's the way I thought of the welfare state. That it really it was a subsidiary to full employment, mm -hmm. and that and that, that where I grew up, it was a very disadvantaged area, and uh, uh, the, the 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 male in those days uh, could get it. Always had a job, mm -hmm. and. Um, the, 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 the children then were supported through the welfare state to stay at school and uh, get enough bread and uh, that allowed the social mobility. And I, you know, the, the way I think about it now is that the white population in disadvantaged areas are suffering from passive welfare in the same way that you identified? What, what I didn't um, know, this is the thing I did not know, because it was that unemployment was a choice by government. By, that's right. I didn't know that. I accepted the general line that there's structural unemployment. You couldn't do anything about couldn't it. Couldn't do anything about it. And I'd... I'd, so, you know, this was a kind of, if, if our mob, the Indigenous Australians, are down the bottom of the Australian pyramid, where structural unemployment sits, then it would be inevitable that our mob are disproportionately affected by yeah. unemployment. And there was very little that could be done about that. Um, other than urging, um, other than two things, probably. One, urging the mob to try and in take whatever opportunities arise. Yeah. You know, if there's a chance of peeling one by one people off that unemployment pool into entry level work, let's keep doing that, let's encourage that. Um, but that becomes a little churn. It doesn't really change the. Yeah prevalence of unemployment. That just shuffles the queue. Just shuffles the queue. And th that's the words I read in the, I think in the text here. Or in, well, it's or one of the sort of imageries I've always said. If you yeah, haven't got enough jobs, you I can thought, train the well, people. That was an insight that, that this, this is a pretty uh, d d disheartening thing in that all of the attempts to go from welfare to work are really shuffling the queue. If there's not enough jobs. If there's not enough jobs. Yeah. So it, the, the idea that, that, that the unemployment pool is a policy choice of governments is the kind of blinding flash, the, the, the kind of illumination for me. I'd never heard of this argument before. Um, because of the, you know, the, the prevalence of the idea that, that unemployment's here to stay and yeah. it is structural and... Well, that was, the, that was the way in which the governments 
sold their choice to absolve themselves from that responsibility. I mean, if you remember John Howard said that we're not about full employment anymore, we're about full employability. And that was his sort of idea that the Australian government's responsibility no longer was about jobs, it was for preparing people for jobs. And that uh, that was the big shift in, and that started with uh, Hawke and Keating. Ready if and when we have a job. That's what they were saying, remember? That full employability became the government's responsibility, whereas during the, what I call the, the full employment consensus period, the responsibility of the government was to make sure there were enough jobs yeah. everywhere. And, uh, and that was the big shift we had in our, in, in our uh, history. In, and that's why I thought that when, when I read that speech, mm. at the, around about the same time you delivered, I was mm. pretty, I, I wouldn't say annoyed, but I, I thought that, that this is buying in, because buying into that full employability thing, that, mm. you know, mm. that it's a supply side problem, not a demand mm. side problem, not mm. a, that there's not a shortage of jobs, there's a shortage of people who want to work. Mm. And, and the way I thought, and, and, and I thought that I didn't fully understand all of the stuff that you've just talked about. Mm. I had inklings, but uh, what I thought that was that the, I'm not sure what we'd call them, but the sort of uh, uh, neoliberal white academic political sort of community I think that they used what you were saying to advance a very offensive agenda. Mm. Let me put some numbers around it for a typical village in Cape York, right? So, you know, in a, in a community of a thousand plus people, there may be 400 people who want and work. Um, want work? Yeah, yeah, and who want work. And there may be 60, 70 jobs available, um, either with the local council or with other organisations and government departments that mm. uh, operate in the village. Is what you're saying, is it not a shortage of jobs? It, there is a, absolutely, in the absolute number, there is a shortage yeah. of jobs. It is just that the, the few jobs that are available, some of them aren't even taken up. Yeah. See, the, see, see and so, so we'll get a cleaner. We'll get a cleaner from Cairns to clean the school. When there's, it's a kind of job that the locals could do. Sure. And 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 locals are making making calculations about well. I get this much on welfare, and if I'm getting a family tax benefit on top of that, mm. well, the, why would I take a cleaning job at the school? So I've made myself somewhat unpopular among progressives because I advocate a job guarantee, as you know. Yeah. Which is an unlimited offer of a job to anyone who wants it at a socially inclusive wage. But as part of my philosophical view, I have a view that the government has responsibility to do that, to make sure there is enough work. That's embedded in our commitments to various declarations of human rights and international treaties, labour organisation treaties and stuff. But at the same time, I think that uh, as citizens, we have a reciprocal ob obligation to contribute to society if we can. Now, that doesn't mean that people who can't work shouldn't be fully supported to have a decent life. But it means that if you are able to do something and the government's offering you a job, well, then you have a responsibility, in my view, to do that, look after your own family and stuff like that. And so in that context, and this is what upsets the, a lot of progressives, uh, I advocate the abandonment of the unemployment system, benefit system, that if there's enough jobs, you don't need unemployment benefits. And... Uh, it doesn't mean that you, if you lose your job, you, you suddenly have no income because you immediately can get a, government, a job guarantee job. But, and so that, how would that 
my, my suspicion is that some people won't take jobs that are there if they've got, an, if they've got access to welfare. That's your, your sort of problem. I'm completely on the same page with you on, yeah. that, on that policy. But would that alter the situation in your communities? If there was no unemployment benefit, but there was a job there, how would that change the dynamic in people's minds? It would be the most productive, useful, beneficial thing we could ever do to get out of the crisis of remote Australia. Right. It would be the most productive thing we could do. And the I'd heard of, you know, I'd heard people call for um, government employment schemes full employment and so on. I had never heard a persuasive case that answered the objections to it. And the objections being, oh, it'll cause inflation and, yeah. you know, it's... So prior to coming across your work, um, I'd, I'd heard people express the idea that, that government could create um, uh, employment where the private um, economy is not create, not, doesn't have the jobs, but I'd, al I, I'd always associated with that, that with kind of socialist spending schemes, because that's the way it's characterised, yeah. right? And, demonised. Um, yeah, demonised. And um, I, but I hadn't heard the, 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 the persuasive case uh, until I, I think I saw one of your discussions on YouTube, actually. Right. When, when, you, when you talked about, and it was really, what I, I gather must have been your eureka moment with the wool shed. Yeah, I mean, that's where I got the idea of her job guarantee from. Yeah, and, and the light went on for me at that point when I, when I understood the um, cold winter day in Melbourne. Right. I was studying, I was in my fourth year, right. Melbourne University. And I was the, one of the subjects that in my honours year was uh, agricultural economics. Right. And of course, at that time, we, we, were, we had the wool price stabilisation scheme. The farming lobby had pressured the government to, uh, to guarantee, that basically stabilise their income so that they didn't go up and down with the sort of uh, vagaries of the wool clip. And uh, so we learnt that the government bought all the wool that was uh, surplus to the market and kept the price stable. And when there was shortage of wool, they sold it out of those big red brick wool stalls all around our cities. And at the time, we were talking 1978, mm -hmm. I wasn't particularly interested in wool. All right. But I said to myself, I remember sitting in the lecture, it was a freezing cold day, there was no heating in the lecture theatres in those days. And I remember thinking while the lecturer, who was uh, Alan Lloyd, was talking, uh, that this is a full employment scheme for wool uh, and an inflation stable stabilisation scheme. Yeah. The, this was the government using its fiscal capacity, uh, which it had as the currency issuer, to make sure that the, the price was stable and absorbing, creating a buffer stock of, of wool to, to ensure that. So they'll become quite interested in buffer stock mechanisms. Right. And that's when I, I, I wrote up in, in, as the final paper in that year, I wrote up the job guarantee sort of concept. At the time I was calling it the BSE, Buffer Stock Employment. Wow. And uh, then of course in the 90s I met up with Warren and we started the MMT project. And around about the same time, uh, the mad cow disease hit Britain, right. which was called the BSE. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to change the branding. I, I had to change the name of the, the scheme. I could no longer call it the buffer stock employment approach. Yeah. And so we eventually went back to, there'd been a long history of people calling, talking about job, you know, job guarantees, not within a buffer stock concept, but using that label. And so we decided to go back to that 
mm. labelling. Uh, the Amer uh, Warren was talking about employer of last resort. Uh, that the ELR, ELR terminology, and I objected to that. That was his nifty play on central bank being the lender of last resort. So if the central bank can bail out the blank banks, they can bail out all of. They can, yes. we can have the government with using its fiscal capacity for full employment. But I objected to that because. I said to Warren, look, uh, people aren't inanimate objects. We, we, we can't use that analogy. So that's where we can... I'm interested, I'm re interested in two things. One, the eureka moment. Yeah, I, I really... That was a eureka moment. Eureka moment, moment yeah. In, in your life, right? And secondly, that these ideas, when those eureka moments happen, how they become a core idea for your future yeah. work? Well, you know, I, 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 was, I wasn't enamoured with the orthodox economics mm -hmm. I, because I was studying and becoming an adult in a period where what we now call sort of neoliberalism was starting to do all this stuff. Mm. Uh, and uh, you know, I saw it in my own, my own family that uh, my father lost his job uh, and that devastated him. He was a man of full employment. He was, he was a poor man, but he, worked, he could work. And that was his sense of self-esteem, his sense of contribution, of pride, working for a minimum wage. But, mm. So that was really important, uh, and so I started. I was studying economics when the the monetarist revolution came to the to the discipline. When uh, and in the political manifestation, it was Maggie Thatcher and mm -hmm. things like that in Britain, and uh, the Razor Gang in Australia, mm -hmm. uh, Phil Lynch and Malcolm Fraser, the mm -hmm. the nineteen eighty two recession. Mm -hmm. Then all of then Hawke and Keating starting to embrace a lot of ideas I found to be quite objectionable mm -hmm. in the name of free markets and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the Japanese uh, commercial property crash, which was the biggest crash in history in the early 90s. And um, they had one negative quarter of GDP. And I said to myself, how the hell has Japan done that? And it's because they were using their fiscal capacity properly at a time when we had Paul Keating talking about the recession we had to have mm -hmm. and we had massive unemployment in Australia, the rise of underemployment in that 91 recession, uh, suppressed real wages growth and all of the things that went with that. We had Paul Keating saying that's what we had to have, yet Japan had a much bigger crash than we did and yet they, they, the unemployment hardly went up. And so that's that, that, that eureka moment earlier and a, a whole period of exploring all of those anomalies and things led to me thinking about it, starting along my MMT journey. Mm -hmm. And then I met Warren, who was a bank, a big banker, like a, you know, not an academic at all. Mm -hmm. And he'd come up with the same ideas, really. And he had a different emphasis on banking, and my emphasis was on buffer stocks and things like that. But mm -hmm. that's how we started. And right. There's quite a, a sort of unity of science, I think, uh, right. coming from totally different backgrounds. And uh, then we start then. And he hadn't studied economics? He had done a, a, a basic economics degree back right. in the 70s and then he'd gone to Wall Street and made, made a lot of money in, in speculative financial markets. And he's a, he's a quite interesting character because he, yeah, he doesn't, he, he's operated in that milieu but doesn't share its values and, uh, and is sort of an eccentric thinker. And, uh, so he was able to work all this out. So I'm, I'm 
thinking about these issues um, during the 90s, because I read John Ralston Saul's books, mm. and particularly, um, so this is not economics, but it's kind of philosophy and slash... Justice and all of it. Yeah. Ethics. And ethics and so on. And, um, but his, his chapters on the kind of financial industry that had developed, mm. um, I, it just rings true today, you know, and that, this is what, 93 or something, 91 yeah. or something. And um, so Saul, reading Saul got me thinking about, oh gee, this, the, what we call the neoliberal turn has got all of these huge problems with it. Yeah. And, and, and Saul's banging on about this in, in his books um, back in the early 90s. And so th that's the source of my thinking from on the periphery uh, about... Um, but my, my overwhelming sense during all, well, over the last 20 years, 30 really, is the progressives don't have an alternative paradigm. That's right. They don't have an alternative economic policy. I, 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 we, I published a book with an Italian journalist a couple of years ago called Reclaiming the State, where, where the, the, I'd been becoming really interested in why the left, you know, the progressives, had, had really lost the plot and where, where it started to happen and what, what we, we, we call them the turning points in the book. And you can trace it back to the British Labor Party in the mid-70s when, when Dennis Healy became entranced with monetarism. And that was the famous speech by James Callaghan at the, uh, the, the um, 1976 Labor Annual Conference where he said that the era of Keynes in not verbatim, is dead. The idea that governments can now use its spending to create jobs is over. And that was the, that was the first real neoliberal wow. stuff. Yeah, amazing. And uh, then, of course, they, in the same way that longing in New Zealand set the, set the scene for the austerity that followed for the National Party, the same way Hawke and Keating, in my view, set the scene for uh, Costello and Howard. Mm -hmm. Healy and Callaghan set the scene for Thatcher. And then that, later on in uh, France, France uh, Mitterrand's 1983 government, that had the big austerity turn. They'd been elected on a socialist charter to redress the sort of ravages from the, in the late 70s, from the bar plan, which was a, you know, just decimated employment and uh, uh, all in the name of fighting inflation. Mm. All the countries had inflation problems after the OPEC oil crisis, mm. that was obvious. And the way they addressed it uh, was the interesting thing. And uh, so you had these series of progressive political parties turning into monetarists and what we now call neoliberal. And the intellectual support on the progressive side all bought the idea that the state had lost its power in the face of global capital and the global capital ruled and all that, all that the governments could do was make sure that they appeased global capital. And uh, all of the major Social Democratic parties, however, whatever they're called, Labor Party here, and you know, bought that line. And meanwhile, back at the ranch, the right were developing really coherent strategies to take over, or, or to what I, what we call reconfigure the state in their own interests, and reverse all of the stuff that the Social Democratic era had, the full employment era had, had had given the more equal sharing of income and uh, mm -hmm. 
opportunities for upward mobility for lower income communities and uh, mass education and all of that. And so, you know, the, the left then got, in my view, completely obsessed with postmodernism and identity and started to abandon the idea of class, that your position in society was more to do with your gender or your, your, mm. your, your ethnic background or whether mm. you're gay or not. And mm. all of those things are really important issues, but they just get, got diverted from the main game that the, mm. the currency issuing government can always act, in, act to serve one interest or another. And uh, they lost that perception and then, you know, the modern manifestation now is this obsession with fiscal surpluses and, mm. you know, you've got, well, I mean, I heard it on the radio the other day, the, the shadow treasury spokesman here, Jim Chalmers, saying, mm. well, we'll consider, you know, we've got unemployment benefits now at poverty wages, at poverty, below poverty levels. And we've got the shadow treasurer of the so-called progressive party saying, we'll only consider adjusting unemployment benefits, not we'll create jobs. We'll only, if, we'll only consider adjusting it if it doesn't compromise our surplus target. That's sort of, I, I, I nearly... When you, you know, after a, Coming across your work, and 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 coming across your textbook, I'm and coming from the point of view that I do, that I see a social wreckage as a result of people's exclusion from the economy, yeah. an accumulating social wreckage. Uh, and I keep saying to people how people weren't in jail. We. we we didn't have children in child protection. We didn't have the um, the massive social problems we have today. Uh, back when we lived in poverty, mm. um, in 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 kind of um, uh, low paid work, we just didn't have those problems that we do today, um, and to the horrific degree. And so, what what fills me with the visceral what has been filling me with a visceral anger after reading your work is the idea that the accumulation of this suffering and the problems is a policy choice yeah. made by government and that our people are an unemployment buffer stock. Yeah. We're used our people, and our, I've been starting the conversation with our mob in the Cape. You know, we have been consigned to play a role in the Australian economy, and that role is to be an unemployment buffer stock for national economic policy. And, and the price we've paid for that, and the price we are paying for it today, is just outrageous. Sure. And, um, and, and, you know, you, you talk about the crimes against our people in history. This is the contemporary crime, and it's ongoing. But it's not just against your people. It's I, against, I know, against I know. It's just that we, we represent, yeah. uh, in, in, in kind of percentage terms, big mob of our mob it's, are it's, part it's of that shocking. stock. And the way we've constructed that, it... it you know, I think I think to back to my my upbringing. If my father hadn't had a full employment and been out of work, mm. where would have I ended up? And uh, if I had no access to a job, and uh, what would I do? And uh, you know, it's we know that there's all these other pathologies that come with social with uh, unemployment. Social exclusion is the beginning of it. Your social network starts to shrink. Uh, your self-esteem plummets. Uh, and, and what we've done in Australia and, and right around the world is, is blame the victim for a systemic failure. Mm. 
and this, and it's quite obvious that people who are alienated and excluded are going are going to be more susceptible to family breakdown, to mental illness, to to you know, if I if I didn't have food on the table, I might steal too, and I, and all the rest of it, you know. I've I've never viewed this as some kind of personal moral failure on the individual. I've always understood this as a systemic problem. Yeah, but it's, but a, it's a chosen systemic problem. What I didn't know was that it is a chosen systemic problem. Yeah. Um, that, that there's been a policy choice involved here. Yeah. And, and, and so if you, if you wind back history to the mid-60s and that tragic removal of Aboriginal people out of the cattle industry in Northern Australia, yeah. right? right across Western Australia, Northern Territory, Queensland and so on, people just being mass removed off the cattle stations. Well, what were the policy, and, and this was all understood, it was all understood before the Arbitration Commission mm. that this would be the consequence. Yeah. It was completely anticipated. And the only response, well, we'll sign people up to unemployment benefits, yeah. was the policy response, right? That was right? the choice. That was the choice. And, and to now look back and say, well, there was another choice, yeah. which is we could sustain the employment, the Commonwealth government could provide, it, new, types could of provide new types of employment so that people can remain where they no, are no. and be productive. I, I, a couple, some years ago, I did some work in Northern Territory on six remote communities. I spent two years working on that project. And, I came across government officials regularly telling me that, oh, oh, the solution to these remote communities is we've got to get a pri the more private activity in. And I'd say, well, look, there is no private activity that's going to come in here. What you've got, what the only solution is, is to make the government activity work better and more effectively and more productively. And that that has to be government jobs. And I'd say, oh no, we've got to lay the ground for private sector jobs. I said, they're never going to be private sector jobs. And that, that was all political choice. They had this ideology that you could not create government jobs in those areas, yet they were going to be the only jobs that were in those areas. And so the challenge wasn't whether you should have them or not, it was what, what they would do and uh, to have, have you know dialogue with the local people as to what their community needs were and what what and we identified literally thousands of jobs that could be done in those communities that would be what I would call highly productive, mm. uh, provide a sense of purpose and self-esteem, mm. and a wage, mm. an income, and get get the wealth, get rid of the welfare. And Bill, I I, I think you could see that uh, see this as a a program like that, as a, a job guarantee program, as something that would that would change over time, because the employer, once you've kind of stabilised the f life of the community and the life of the families, and they're bringing up kids that are now going to school, getting getting the best education they can. You're going to be building the, the, the skills, the employment skills of the yeah. people so that, um, you know, more and more people are, are, are taking up different kinds of work, more skilled work. And of course, the ones at the top are ready to take advantage of any private sector sure. jobs that become available. But, but, but also the people there's an element in there's some people in that population that are that are getting skilled who will be have an entrepreneurial idea yep they'll start to they'll start to develop little businesses yes. or something yes and that's the way you get a broader richer labor market yeah but but you've got to start from the fact that you haven't got you won't get that dynamic unless you start yeah so that's why I think the job guarantees... Oh, I, I can see how it can work. Yeah. And it is, you know, I, I see the, the job guarantee. Our aspirations 
nationally in terms of uh, is to have a voice to the parliament and once we have a representative body we will seek to negotiate a treaty with the Australian parliament and one of the first agenda items of a treaty would have to be this issue of full employment good on you you know it's it's got to be um and in, and in terms of the the social dividend from that the social and cultural dividend from a full employment scheme is is yeah, I mean I could just see it. It is the single most important thing we need to do. So that's what I hope our coalition that we've we, we're trying to build, and I think yeah. we 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 will build. Yep. We'll be able to assist with. Yeah. So I know you've got to finish today, but here's a quote from that speech. Okay. I do not have any economic policies for the country. That's what you told the assembly at Bathurst. I think that's different now, is it? Yeah. You do have economic policies. I looked around for a progress at progressive alternative and I couldn't find one. Yeah. And um, the progressives had dropped the ball after Keynes, after the oil shock, yeah. complete vacuum. Sure. And the right took control of the vacuum. I used to go to conferences in the set, sort of as a young academic, progressive conferences, political economy conferences, and all the talk was about hermeneutics and ontology and, and gender and all of this. That's, that's what, there was no macroeconomic discussions at all. They completely... Had class become... Class had become... Passe or...? Passe. Uh, people would even be presenting papers that class was now irrelevant. That, uh, 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 that our, as I said before, that our identity was really linked to gender or, you know, things like that, rather than our class position within the economy. And, uh, but but the, the stark thing, and because I was interested in macroeconomics and interested in creating a body of work that would be a contest to, to the prevailing orthodoxy, which, which, I did, which I'd rejected. So for me, the abandonment of, of, of uh, a research agenda that was building up a, a macroeconomic body of work that was different, that had empirical base, that had... Uh, internal consistency was was an absolute shock and that's what I so that's what I, I've made my career to do as a progressive as a self-identifying progressive but uh, yeah I mean the left the, the left and the political economy people just abandoned all of that in my view I, I developed this anger maybe to uh, against progressives <laughs> but but what I used to call them progressivists. They ascend into the middle class yeah. and they don't realise that, you know, whilst they say that their fidelity is to the working class, um, the views they propel, I think, are, are very much middle class views yeah. and they've lost sight of the mob they say they are keeping faith with. And we've just seen a dramatic expression of that, I think, in the British election where right. the northern working class have abandoned Labor big time. Mm. Anyway, I know you've got to go to Sydney, so okay. we'll, we'll see each other soon in Woodford. At Woodford. Yeah, cool. Mm.